What I will try to do today is to talk about this war, again, from the historical perspective, about use and misuse of history in the justification of this war, about the, the origins of the war and also the impact, the consequences that we can foresee. So we historians normally have trouble uh, predicting the past, but in, in, in this new new circumstances, we really, we really have to think not only about the past, but all, also about the future. And uh, once you use those lenses, you can actually see things that, that otherwise probably, if, if you are just focused on today, if you are focused immediately on tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, that probably you can't, you can't see. So I will start with the, with the misuses of history and abuses of history. Vladimir Putin and his uh, essay uh, on the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians have been uh, already mentioned here. His um, speech on February 21st, 2022, a few days before the all-out invasion, was called by some observers to be a history lecture. So really, in my, in my works as a historian, I don't remember any other war where there would be so much history at the beginning, so much history at the start, and so bad history. Because the argument, the key argument that is there in, in the essay, in the numerous pronouncements, in the long speeches, is that Russians and Ukrainians are one and the same people. So what is there really is not that Russians are really Ukrainians. What is there is that Ukrainians are really Russians and they don't exist or they don't have the right to exist. This is, uh, for me, immediately, as, as I listened to the, to the, to the speech on the February 21st, 2022, I, I came to realization that the war that is coming is not just the war, the regional war, the, so, something that was happening before that in Eastern, in Eastern Ukraine. That the, the attempt is really to put an end to the existence of the entire Ukrainian state and nation, at least as and independent entities. And another thing that I, I um, realized, and that, that already came with, with my work as a historian on the 19th century and 18th century, was that there was nothing particularly original in that thought, because for those of you who have a chance to see, to see the image, but this is, this is the poster that comes from 19th century Russia. It depicts uh, three sisters, uh, Great Russia, Little Russia, or Ukraine, and White Russia. And that's the image, that's the symbol of the Russian nation, the way how it was imagined by the political thinkers, by, by the rulers, by, by the military commanders at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, including by people like uh, Anton Dinikin, the uh, general of the Russian White Army during the revolution, whose, whose diary uh, in particular was, was, was read by Putin, but also by many other Russian uh, post-revolutionary emigres. So what we see today is really going back on the part of, of Putin, but also Russian propaganda machine, going back to the ideas and models of the 19th century, imperial models, and an attempt to bring them back and introduce into the in, into 21st century, rejecting what was happening uh, in that part of the world even in, during the Stalinist time and the Stalinist period because Lenin and Stalin are under attack for being too, too lenient toward nationalities and Ukrainians in particular and recognizing them as a separate nation at least for former. So we see an attempt really to turn the clock back to the 19th century not only in terms of the legitimization of certain actions, but also in terms of the actions themselves. Because if you look at what is happening to the Ukrainian books, history books, in the, temper, in the occupied territories in Ukraine, it's not yet the, 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 the stakes, they're not burning, but certainly the, those books are being thrown in the, uh, through the windows and, and destroyed and removed from the, from the uh, circulation altogether. The irony 
uh, of the recent uh, 30, 40 years history is that the Soviet Union was dissolved by the leaders of the very same groups that you saw at the previous image, uh, the, by the leaders of Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus. So the, the, the core, the, the Slavic core of the, of the uh, Soviet Union made this decision about dissolving, dissolving the, the USSR. And the role of one of this, of one of this uh, people on the, on the uh, picture is especially important. And this is, this is the role of the person on the left, Leonid Kravchuk, the first president of uh, Ukraine uh, in 1991. Why it is important, not because Kravchuk himself, but because the country that he represented at that time. He is, um, the picture was taken one week after the Ukrainian referendum for independence, where 92% plus minus 92% of those who participated in the referendum voted for independence. The question that Ukrainians asked, answered in that referendum was not whether you want the Soviet Union to continue or not. The question was whether you want Ukraine to become independent, whether you support the decision of the parliament of Verkhovna Rada of Ukraine to, to, for independence. But one week after that, the Soviet Union was dissolved. The question is why? And the answer is that without Ukraine, which was the second largest Soviet republic and then post-Soviet republic, neither Gorbachev nor Yeltsin were actually prepared to go on and continue with the Soviet, with the Soviet project. Yeltsin kept saying again and again uh, to uh, President George H.W. Bush at that time, without Ukraine, we would be outnumbered and outvoted by non-Slavic Muslim republics. So there was cultural component, but there was religious component and, 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 and others as well. So Ukraine became really central back then in 1991 for the question of whether the Soviet Union would survive or not, whether it would continue or not. And Ukraine continued to be central for the question of whether Russia would be able to reinstate its control on the post-Soviet space. And in that sense, looking at this picture, looking at this image, Understanding what is behind it also provides some perspective on why we have this horrible war between Russia and Ukraine. And the question is, uh, the, the answer rather is that the, the, because, because without keeping Ukraine under the Russian control, any attempts to re-establish Russia's dominance in the post-Soviet space are really, w would be incomplete. There is a lot of discussion about why we got this war and got it now, and I mean the all-out attack. One thing that is important to answer this question is to get chronology straight. And chronology straight means that, yes, the war started in February, but the war didn't start in February of 2022. The war started in February of 2014 with the Russian military takeover of the buildings of the Crimean parliament and Crimean government, the cabinet of ministers. And why did it start in February 2014? What predated it was the revolution of dignity. At the center of that revolution was the question of whether Ukraine would sign or not sign association agreement with European Union. Not membership in the European Union, not candidate membership in the European Union, not membership in NATO, association agreement with European Union. But it was extremely important because if Ukraine would sign, and eventually it did sign association agreement with European Union, it would not be able to join any Eurasian Union that Vladimir Putin was at that time uh, uh, contemplating and, and trying to put together. So the war started over the issue of how to keep Ukraine within the Russian sphere of influence. And the war in 2022 actually continued with the, basically the same, the same goal because what happened in 2014 and 2015 as the result of uh, first uh, Ukraine's protests, movement, movement clo closer to the European Union, uh, the annexation of the Crimea, the uh, hybrid warfare in Donbass, none of that really affected Ukraine's trajectory. 
Ukraine continued moving toward the West. And Vladimir Putin, and, and I, I, I advise you to read closely what, what he is saying, because very often this is, this is what many things that he believes in, like Russians and Ukrainians and so on, and the same people. In his article on the historical um, unity of Russians and Ukrainians, he was saying that, well, the West produced in Ukraine that system where the parties change, the leaders change, but the, the attitude toward Russia continues and, and persists. The idea was to wait for the election of President Zelensky, a, a, a comedian who had no political experience with the idea that Russia would actually can get finally its way. But democracy, democracy that survived in Ukraine and didn't survive in Russia kept producing actually people who were representing the Ukrainian the, the attitude in the Ukrainian society. So on that, on that particular issue, issue Putin was absolutely, was absolutely right. The uh, Minsk agreements, that, again, that's, that's the image coming from there. Um, first uh, of 2014, 2015, had as, as its goal to um, conduct um, Ele uh, so-called elections under the Russian control in eastern part of Ukraine, and then push those puppet, Russian puppet states into the constitutional body of Ukraine, making any independent foreign policy, any movement toward the West impossible. But once, once the realization came that the change of the uh, government, the change of the, of the president, the change of the Rada really doesn't, Rada is the parliament, really doesn't change the course of Ukraine, then, then came the war, the all-out all aggression. That was not happening anymore only in, in Donbass, in eastern Ukraine, but was, was the, the primary goal was Kiev with the goal either capture Volodymyr Zelensky or, or kill him. And one of the things that is absolutely new and that we didn't have before is that in a matter of speaking, the war in Ukraine already went nuclear. That is, that is something, something that, 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 that is new certainly for this war. In my book, I call this war a uh, uh, 19th century war in terms of ideology, 20th century war in terms of the battle tactics, and 21st century war in terms of some of the, some of the equipment and munition, the weapons that are being used on the, on the front lines. And indeed, you, you, you see, you see this three very different types of war and, 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 and periods coming, coming together in Ukraine. The impact of the war on on, on Ukraine, on the region, and the world. And I will, I will conclude here and really look forward then to, 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 to the discussion. This is a photo of the monument to the um, Russian-Ukrainian friendship that was in downtown Kyiv, that survived the war of 2014-2015, the annexation of the Crimea, the war in Donbass, but didn't survive the Russian missile attacks on Kyiv in February and March of 2022. So it, didn't, it wasn't hit by Russian missile attack, but the Ukrainians removed, removed this monument. And this is, this is very symbolic. The war that started with the idea that Russians and Ukrainians were one and the same people produced the level of mobilization and thank you very much for mentioning that, all that, and, and the level of identity, and particular type of identity, that if existed in Ukraine before, certainly was not as articulated, was not as crystallized, was not, was not as, as powerful. And this is something that will not change tomorrow, whatever the outcome of the war would be. I'm, I'm thinking about this as a long-term outcome. Well, that's, that's the image that probably um, needs no needs no uh, much, much of commentary in terms of the historical context when it was taken. But we are really going back in many ways to the Cold War era in terms of Europe and what is happening in Europe. The gray zones that existed in Europe after the fall of the Berlin Wall actually are disappearing today. There is no question that Ukraine is on actually accelerating its movement toward toward the West, there is no question that Russia is turning, turning uh, its back on Europe and reorients itself both economically, politically, militarily, and otherwise toward, toward the uh, 
East. That's that's about that's about another Cold War image and another Cold War parallel. Um, mm, mm, the war started a few days after signing an agreement on no limited cooperation between between China and Russia. And uh, while it became quite clear that there were limits to non-limited cooperation, we really don't know wh where those limits are or where they will be in the next uh, months, next year, or next two years. But there are things that are already very clear. That compared to what was happening in the Cold War era, the role in that alliance or alliance to be had changed and shifted. If China in the 1950s was the country that was behaving, uh, behaving erratically and challenged in, in the most clear way, in the most dangerous way, the international order that existed at that time, and the Soviet Union was more conservative part of the, of the alliance, it was also the senior member of the alliance, now we have situation shifted the other way around. China is actually... Uh, m m more concerned about the preservation of some of some form of, of the existing international order, with with different poles, of course, but but clearly clearly not not challenging that in the way irresponsible way, especially when it comes to things nuclear, as Russia does today. And as a historian, I can't notice that we are there are many many elements suggesting that we are going back to the situation with the bipolar world of uh, Cold War era. I, I don't have Conrad Adenauer's quotes, but I have Mark Twain's one. <laughs> and it's, it's um, about history not repeating itself, but rhyming. So despite all these parallels with uh, Cold War, one thing is sure that it will be not the, the exact same, the repetition of the exact same situation. And uh, we, already, we already see that and we already notice that. And compared to the Cold War I, whatever will come next, we'll see, or at least we'll have to see, and we'll have rely on the alliance of the, of the countries that, uh, democracies in particular, but of the countries that want to keep this world going and to preserve this international order, in which the role of countries like Germany and Japan will be, or at least has to be, much bigger, much stronger than it was during the Cold War. Uh, I see signs of that already, already happening, so it will be different world, hopefully we can learn from the mistakes, we can learn from the um, victories of, of, of that period, but there will be new challenges and we all have to be prepared for them no matter when and how this war will end. And final, final thought. As a historian, I promised to you at the beginning that history allegedly allows us to see actually further than we would see otherwise. So I have no doubt how long-term this war will end. This is one of the imperial wars. We know what happens to the empires. We know that the states that come out of their ruins emerge, emerge victorious. We look at the history of the Cold War and after Cold War, and please name me one case where a major power won a war with a weaker power which was fueled by the idea of national, of national sovereignty. The question is, while I know how this war will end, I don't know when it will end. And I don't know how much, how much price in blood, in, 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 in suffering, in, in wealth will be spent on that. But again, one thing from history that at least I learned, and history can be read in different ways, is that the more and the harder we try today, the easier it will be tomorrow. So thank you very much for your attention.